This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I wanted to bring you on the show, man, because you, you directed this, um, this, this, this wonderful documentary called The Last Blockbuster. And many people listening on the show know that I, too, worked at a video store, not the corporate horrible corporate juggernaut that was blockbuster um that just crushed the mom and pops i worked in one of those mom and pops and only went to blockbuster when i couldn't find a copy of something uh and every time i'd walk in i'd be like ah this is amazing they got 400 copies of something but yet i still hated them because they took business away from us but now i look back at blockbuster and hollywood video i'm just like no like i, I kind of miss it uh but you wrote this you wrote you did this amazing documentary i gotta know First of all, how did this get started? What did you, like, why did you say, hey, Blockbuster, let's do this? Well, I loved renting videos since I can remember, since I was a kid. And it was always, like, a big part of my life. And I, I loved it. And I would, like, you know, save up my allowance so I could walk down to Hollywood Video or Blockbuster or the local store, ride my bike and rent a VHS and take it home for the weekend and watch it four or five times, that kind of thing. So, you know, I'm of that generation where, I mean, it was a big deal and I've watched it kind of disappear. And then, uh, like I said, I moved here to Oregon uh, six years ago now. And the first week I moved here, uh, right by my house, there was a blockbuster video that was going out of business. This was 2015. So, you know, they had recently corporate had gone away and I knew uh, blockbuster videos going away. There's not really video stores anymore. Netflix is huge. But before even our furniture arrived, you know, we had like shipped it via pods. And I went to this blockbuster video that was closing and I bought all the DVDs and Xbox games and things that were 90% off and, you know, a dollar and bought all the things and tried to buy the, you know, the blockbuster sign on the wall, but they wouldn't sell it to me. So I, I was excited. I was like, Oh, that's cool that this town that I just moved to had a blockbuster still too bad. It closed. And then flash forward about a year, I had been driving around town and I would see another big blockbuster sign the big blue ticket that we all know the shape of. Um, and I thought, ah, oh, look at that. They couldn't afford to take the sign down. They just had to leave it up, you know, because it's so expensive. And you see them all over the country. People send me pictures of them now. Oh, Once a week, somebody's I, like, did you know there's still a Blockbuster? I'm like, yeah, go inside. Yeah, see what I, you find. I got a pep. I got a, yeah, my, mine's is a Petco. It's a giant, yeah, it's a exactly. new Petco, but they wouldn't take the damn thing down. So it's it's like, right. it's like a movie ticket with Petco on it. They're like, yep. I'm not taking that down. That's going to cost yeah. you. I don't even, the one in cost? Washington, D.C. How, how does it cost to take that down? It must be cost a, a lot of money. It's huge. They're huge. Right. They're huge. You got to get a crane in there. It's a whole thing. <laughs> if you've ever had to have a hot tub moved, you know. Um, <laughs> the what you say in Washington, in Washington, what? In Washington, the one near me was a liquor store, but it was the ticket shape and it was, you know, <laughs> liquor store, <laughs> liquor store video. Right. But for for some reason, one day I just the, my curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to take a picture of the abandoned store for Instagram or something. And I stopped and I went in. And it was like going through a time warp. It was like no one told them Blockbuster had gone out of business like they didn't get the memo. I went in and it, it looked the same, it felt the same, and it smelled the same as I remember. You know, it was like, oh, it's 1999 and I'm going to rent The Phantom Menace and it's awesome. And the only difference was this was 2017 by this point. And so it was the new Star Wars movie and it was the new Marvel movie where, where the 200 copies up on the new release wall. So it was very nostalgic, but at the same time exciting of like, wow what the heck is going on here? Who is still renting movies? Because that was the other thing. It was packed with people renting DVDs. It was like this weird and back I, to the future scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't understand what was going on. And so that day I talked to the owner and the manager and said, hey, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I'm doing air quotes for those listening. <laughs> I'm a filmmaker. Would it be okay if I started bringing cameras around and just like interviewing some customers if they're okay with it? You know, I'll, I'll, I won't get in your way. I'm just fascinated. And they said, 
oh, okay, that's weird. No one's really ever tried to, you know, nobody cared at that point. Um, and that was, that was the beginning of it. I've been, it's now four years later and the movie's just now out. So, and when you started, there was still, what, 13 blockbusters? 12. Around the, 12. So 12 blockbusters around the country. And then, yeah, the just, 13th one was the one by my house that closed down. <laughs> right. So it just so happened that you, <laughs> you befriended the, the one blockbuster that's still in existence. So it just was happenstance that you moved or you moved to Oregon and you were close to that one. You could have moved to Alaska. <laughs> or, right. Because that one held up for a little while. And, and that whole John Oliver thing. And I remember John Oliver sent the jock strap from, Cinderella Man or something like that for the uh, Russell Crowe's to get get people to come in the store and you know when yep. we hear like oh in Alaska they they've got blockbusters like that that makes sense there's there's probably bad bad um, internet there and mm -hmm. you know it's still a thing and it's smaller towns I, okay I'll I'll buy I'll yeah. buy that um, yeah when we started we for sure thought the Alaska stores would outlast the Oregon store you know sense. we had no we had no delusions that this was going to be the last blockbuster in the whole world um but we still thought it was an interesting story and we we're just like well we'll follow this store and see what happens and we could there's like nothing we could have done to make it happen the way it did it was all you know documentary filmmaking magic of being in the right place at the right time and making friends with the store before everybody was beating their door down and trying to get the exclusive. Right. So that you were in already and well, I forgot the name of the manager and the, 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 the lady who owns it. What, what's up? Sandy. Sandy. So Sandy, Sandy, by the way, when you watch the movie, Sandy's the star. Um, she is, she is the star of the show. She, she is the heart and soul of that place. Um, she doesn't own it. She just manages it. But the whole thing is, is run because of her. And she's like ride or die. Like she will not go. <laughs> She did not. Yeah. She told her husband, "Like I am not retiring. I am here as long as this store is open, uh, and I will continue to keep." Cr it's just amazing. So while, so while you're make you you got in early in 2015, then I'm sure there was other filmmakers or other news organizations or other that wanted to come in to have that kind of same access. And Sandy's like, "Oh no, yeah, no, we're good. We got somebody. We've got this filmmaker uh, who's <laughs> who's already doing a documentary on us, and we we love him. We love Taylor. Is that basically the way it goes?" That's a little bit how it went um, after I was making another movie at the same time, which um, pro tip, don't do that. <laughs> but I was making two documentaries at once and I, I brought on a partner for the blockbuster doc who had a little bit more Hollywood experience than me. He was a writer for years on um, Dexter's Laboratory, Powerpuff Girls, a bunch of kids shows in the 90s and stuff. Um, and he was very smart. He early on was like, Hey, let's just get a little contract in place for the life rights for the story, just in case it blows up. Um, and I think we would have been fine without it, but it was, um, in hindsight, it was a great idea. Oh, what a <laughs> so, great, great suggestion. <laughs> yeah. So if you're starting a documentary on something that you think might blow up, that's a great tip is just get something in writing that says you're the only one who can make a movie about this. Yeah, they could do it news, news stories and all that stuff. Yeah, they did a ton of news stuff, but anything that was longer, even short form stuff, they they would run it by us. So Sandy would call and say, I don't know, this kid wants to do a, a short documentary for their college thing. Is that OK? And then we would talk to the kid and be like, what's this for? Is it, you know? Wow. You're not going to turn it into a feature, are you? you know, uh, no, no, no I would, I, we don't want to have to sue. Uh, that's, right? <laughs> that's that's I, that's awesome, man. That's, that's an amazing. That's amazing. I don't know if I t I, I, I might have mentioned this to you once. Or I know I mentioned it on the on the on the show once. But my um, when the video stores were all going out of business, Hollywood Video was the big one that kept going out of business around me, and they, and I figured out to um, go in and buy. Uh, some old videos, DVDs, and then I would sell them on Amazon. And I did a little bit here and a little bit there. I made a little little extra cash, and it was when you could still sell DVDs and stuff. But then uh, right before we moved to L.A., when I had no very little savings, we were moving to L.A., my wife and I didn't know anybody. The video, the Hollywood video around the corner finally put up the going out of business sign. And I walked in and said, can I speak to the manager? What can I do for you, sir? And I'm like, I need everybody to leave the store, please. Why? Because I'm going to buy everything you have. <laughs> and I bought the entire, they're like 
fantastic. We can close up early. And I go, do you take Discover? And they go, yes. And I bought, oh God, I, I don't even, I don't, it was just too many. I think 10, like 8,000, 10,000 DVDs and video wow. games. And I spent about 12 grand or something like that uh, on my credit card. And then I told my wife, well, even when we get to LA, if, we, if I can't get a job or you can't get a job, at least we can sell DVDs to keep the, the lights on. And and that's what we did. I mean, we uh, fortunately, both of us got jobs right away and uh, I was off and running and she was off and running, but we must have made 30, 40 grand selling DVD for the next year. For the next year, it was just yeah. a slow drip of like DVD sales and video game sales. I had GameCube, like those old GameCube. TV. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The little mean, discs. I, the little disc. I sold everything, and, th- and that was the Hollywood video. That that was the one that went down on. But I never, I never did a blockbuster because I think blockbusters were still too solid when I left. Because I left in 08. Mm-hmm. In 08. Yeah, blockbuster they were still, still blockbuster was still, but Hollywood video was having issues. So that's when uh, that's when they went down. So I never did a blockbuster. They would start going out of business, and I would over here in L.A. When I got here, there were still blockbusters. I got here in 2008, so there were blockbusters everywhere. Yeah. But then I would, like, as the years go by, I would keep driving by this block. I'm like, how are they still alive? How are yeah. they still going? <laughs> and then that one turned into a Sherman Williams paint store. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the other one turned into the Petco. And, and then slowly but surely, there was a couple of video stores left in my area in the Valley. And one of them is still there, but they're like a VHS. They only do VHS. Mm. they're still alive and i think it's just like anytime you see a documentary about nostalgic vhs or they they just go there and rent it out for the day it's (laughs) so it's amazing to watch the rest of this interview head over to indiefilmhustle.com